direct from the web, it's Billy Masters Live. And now, please welcome your host, Billy Masters. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe you'll see me. Who knows? Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> Johnny, I'm looking at Johnny backstage and we're both like, oh my God. First off, hello everybody. Welcome to Billy Masters Live. I am Billy Masters. I'm your host. We have no idea what is going on today. This is me. You know, there are times that this show is so much fun and we get to talk to all of you people. We get to keep you entertained. I get to be silly and play. And then there are times when you just want to jump out the window. That has been this week. I don't even want to just say this show. This has been this week. It's just been a weird week. Um, well, I guess I should start with, okay, look, somebody's nudging me to say it. Today is Thursday, October 8th. Thank you, Monica. And um. And this is show, I can't even see, is it 55? I don't know. It feels, oh, frankly, it feels like I am 55 at this point. Okay, so I am now seeing a message that I can't read. I get two versions of audio, one live and one delay. Do you have your phone on as well? Or possibly the browser open in two windows? That is a possibility. The other possibility, Johnny, is uh, if you go under your screen and you see the camera mic tab, go to audio and there's a selection to cut the echo. I don't know if that'll help. Um, or you may need headphones. That's the other thing. See, I have a headphone right here. People don't know that um, because I get the delay. But. Sometimes I, when I have two computers on, I get this issue. Anyway, um, so typically I start with an anecdote. First off, let me tell you, I have absolutely no idea who's on the show next week. So we had, you know, not to bore you people with my problems, because, you know, there are bigger problems in the world than Michelle Lee and Lainey Kazan. But as you may recall, we had Michelle Lee and Lainey Kazan Good. Um, scheduled, you know, near the beginning of the run of these shows, back when we were in the single digits, what I like to call the good old days. Oh, it was a simpler and peaceful time then. Um, and then um, there were issues. I, I, it's not really my place to say what the issues are. Perhaps we will talk about it when they're on the show eventually. And um, so we've been trying to reschedule Lainey and Michelle. And right now they are scheduled for next week, but I haven't heard back from them directly. And I hear there could be issues still. So I don't know who's on next week. But as I told Johnny, I did wake up to one bit of just joy, actually a lot of joy. Last night while I was watching the debate, we'll talk about the debate in a second. I was sitting, because I, you know, you get a little lazy and you say, oh, I've got people coming on the show. And then you look and you realize, oh, I don't really have people scheduled because usually I schedule weeks in advance. So last night during the debate, I sent out maybe 25 emails to various friends and people I don't know. And uh, I can tell you that coming up on this show, continuing our string of blonde bombshells, the Lander sisters will be here. Yes, I know. I am excited too. I can't even believe it. Now, there was a discussion about do we want both Landers together or separately? Now, personally, as anybody who has slept with me know, I want them both at the same time. That's just how I am. But I'm not sure what's going to happen. And then perhaps a Charlie's Angel could be here. Perhaps someone from the Mary Tyler Moore show could be here. There are so many people who got back to me since last night, and I just haven't had time to schedule them. So you may have me Tuesday just doing tabloid Tuesday and reading the tabloids to you. And if I do, just keep one thing in mind. You didn't pay to watch this show, okay? 
And it's a holiday next week. And who's getting back to me on Monday of Columbus Day, which I'm not supposed to say Columbus Day. I'm supposed to say Indigenous People Day. But let me ask you this. Does it make the Indigenous people any happier to be celebrated on Christopher Columbus's birthday? I don't think so. Now, I would ask some of my Indigenous people friends. I don't think I have any. So write me. Billy at BillyMasters.com, if you're an indigenous person. Let me know what you think. Um, so, last night's debate. I was, you know, first off, let me just tell you my thought. I thought that it was fine. I watched it and I thought to myself, okay, he's not coming off too much like a Nazi and she's not coming off too much like an angry black woman who's going to cut off his head with a machete. So, I thought that that was good. They were pleasant. They were firm. They were fine. Then I noticed that uh, that uh, Pence, the Nazi, had like some pink eye. Now, I don't think I can show you this, but I notice on most of my shows, I think it's this eye that there's some pink. It might be this eye. Look at that. Can you see is there some pink? I seem to have pink eye when I first get up. A little bit, like in the corner. And by first wake up, I do mean three in the afternoon Eastern time. So I forgave that. Then all of a sudden, he turned his head, and I'm thinking to myself, is that a mic on his head? Because, you know, like Sunset Boulevard, when you saw Glenn Close, it looked like she had a beetle taped to her forehead. It wasn't a mic. It was a fly. Do you see the fly? It's like Jeff Goldblum was at the debate. And I'm just sitting there saying, OMG, there's a fly on the vice president's head. So, you know, I think I'm being clever and I'm the first one to notice it and the only one to notice it. And I post it on Facebook and I say, no flies on Kamala. I think that's clever. Three people write back to me within 30 seconds, one of whom being the divine Roz Ryan, saying, flies always land on shit. I didn't even think of that. Oh. Anyway. Okay. So that's all I have to say about the debate. I don't think it changed the needle one way or the other. Oh, my God. Oh, there it is. Johnny. Okay. I didn't see this last night and uh let me see if i can post it i can okay so john mcdaniel backstage was telling me well did you see the gif of biden and i said i didn't see it so where is it it is right there and so he said well he's sitting backstage with a fly swatter <laughs> that is so funny it just kills me. I mean, this is what it's come to in a different time. Like, they didn't let us know FDR had no legs. I mean, do you realize that the press used to protect the president to make them look their best, that they weren't married to a drunk like Ford or, or that Nixon, that they didn't even want to say he's a crook. And now in real time, we're like swatting flies on people's it's just madness. You know, this isn't my era. That's what I have to say. I don't think this is my era. But I will say what makes me happy for, I don't know how many years, Johnny, put up fingers. How many years was the Rosie show on? Six? Really? All right. Well, four of them were really good. And I would sit every day and the Rosie O'Donnell show was one of uh, my guilt. I can't even say it's a guilty pleasure. It was everybody's guilty pleasure. It was our feel good hour of the day. And, um, and a big part of that was John McDaniel. Um, Rosie would have uh, brought back a live band to daytime. I believe she was the first to do that in a couple of decades. And Johnny's laugh and his talent to go with anything made the show so much fun for me. And you really felt like you were watching friends just sort of hanging out and talking, kind of like I'll be doing with the Lander sisters eventually. But until I have the Lander sisters, I've got the next best thing. I've got John McDaniel.
You're muted, Johnny. Hi, baby. Now you. <laughs> I thought you muted me. I don't know what's going on. No, Sean. <laughs> All right. You so... muted me already. We haven't even started. All right. I'm staying with my parents. John is on the phone with his parents. And we're both saying, oh, I so feel your pain because I'm it's, there every day. But, I can't get away from that. them. But aren't we lucky to have them? You know, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I make fun of them all the time. And, you know, somebody on Tuesday show, uh, my friend Christopher Titus had said, well, how long till you come back to L.A.? I said, it depends when these old people die. <laughs> and, <laughs> It's a part of the equation. It, well, you know, I will say, and I I, I uh, try to correct myself all the time, I do nothing for them. I am here just in case. Like, just in case my mother would have to call me in L.A. and say, I found your father on the foot of the stairwell in a pool of blood. Now I'm here. Now you're there. You can deal with it. Right. Yeah, I could say, well, if he's not moving, can yeah. I sleep a little more and then take care of the blood? But um, nice. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Where great. are your parents? My your parents, parents are in St. Louis, Louis in the house I grew up in. So it's uh -huh. really something. And since this lockdown, since March, I mean, I haven't seen them in person since last Christmas, which kind of hurts. But and I was supposed to be home. I was supposed to go home at the end of March for like a six day hello, check in, be home, you know. And I had to cancel it because everything was canceled. So um, so but I've spoken to them more in the last <laughs> six months than I have spoken to them possibly since I lived there in high school. So well, it's, I mean, I it's every day, and I love it. It's great. We are more. I have spoken to your parents more today than I've spoken to my parents. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Um, you're in a, you're in Fort Lauderdale. You're kind of near my house. Where are you? What part of Fort Lauderdale? So well, without being too, dis you know. Well, I'm behind the Galleria. So you know, so Lauderdale by the sea. It's yes, beautiful, you know, beautiful. Yes, gorgeous. Yeah. So the ocean is near, but we're but not out the window. So right. it's yeah, same it, with me. It feels safe and good, and it's beautiful. I love it. I've always loved South Florida, and I, I, uh, yeah. Charlie, my partner, and I moved here last year, and we love it. Yeah, what timing? So where would you have ended up if you didn't have the place in Fort Lauderdale during what do you mean? the pandemic? Oh, I don't Were know. You still I was, in New York? I, then? I was living in yeah on Long Island. Yeah. And I and I, I would have been there, and that would have been different. But yeah. honestly, it's been great to be here. We have a beautiful, comfortable place to be, and a private pool, and we can, you know, hang out and be just quarantined together with our Frenchie rescue Clarence, who maybe I love Clarence. Photographs of Clarence, yeah, yeah, he's he's our joy. And how far from the water? Because I'm about like four or five blocks. A little further, a little okay. further, but we can bike over there, and we love it. Oh. Right. No, it's just wonderful. I am in Boston, as people know. Yeah. I I usually am down there this time of year. We've been talking like, oh, well, when this clears up, I'll come down and I'll see you. And like, it's not clear. So up. when's that going to be? Yeah, I know. I have no idea. And I think <laughs> But there will come a point. It is starting to get oh. cold here. I mean, yeah. by cold, it was 42 degrees last night. Okay. And that's a little cold. That's, yeah, that's nippy. And, you know, and I, the only thing that really has kept me sane are these shows and getting out and walking. And when it starts getting too cold to walk, I think Corona be damned. I may head down to Florida. Maybe so. Yeah, I feel like because we can still, you know, eat outside. We can still, you know, get oh, right. and outside. And, and uh, so I, I think we're going to have the advantage in the winter in that way. You know, but Florida has been crazy. We've had the most insane numbers and they just went up again yesterday. So, well, you got that crazy governor. I say yeah. you like I'm not a voting Florida citizen. I am as well. Right. No, it's crazy. That guy's. Did nuts. you vote? Did you? Oh, vote? yes. 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 I got my absentee val ballot. So it has been sent out. Vote early. Vote often. That yes. is my that is my rule of thumb. That's what we have to do and get 10 friends to vote. Yep. And if you're uh, and if you're on the fence about who to vote for, and I will, you know, I know people get angry when I say this. I totally get that nobody nobody has ever looked at Joe Biden and been excited. That's just he's a nice guy, but he doesn't get you excited. But you know, you'd be a Boy. lot less excited with the alternative. Correct. Can we just have some calm and some, you know, some sensibility? I mean, it's nuts. And somebody who possibly knows how to operate a fly swatter. Exactly. I think he might hit. <laughs> He'd probably hit him square on the head. That'd be good. 
Oh, my God. So, Johnny, I first met you uh, during the Rosie years. I did not know everything about your background and that you and I actually had an awful lot in common. Right. Um, and a lot but, of friends in common, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. Um, and, you know, what's funny is I also I do judge people by their friends, because if they're people that I know, like have good people in their lives, I'm like, I just jump ahead to, OK, you and I can be best exactly. friends because you're friends exactly. with these people. Um, but I do want to show something which I think was fun, which was um, recently you got to reunite with Rosie um, for yeah. the Actors Fund. So yes, I'm going to just did. show this little clip and From just March. to give people to, yeah, when we thought that this was just going to be a short thing. Right. right. I, know. I know, it's crazy. All right, here's the clip. I love you. Yeah, I have a little song for you. All right, go ahead. For we need a little Rosie right this very minute. Tommy Cruz and Cooch Balls. Come on, let's begin it. We need a lot of joyful Broadway friends this minute. Need a little rosy now. Well, thank you, John. I could not love you more. Aww. I am like Rosie. I couldn't love you more either. What was it like <laughs> working with Rose? I mean, I know obviously you've been friends all these years, but to work yeah. together and kind of do a show. Yeah. Well, the, the TV show was great, but we'd already known each other for years because when we both lived in LA, we would wind up at the same parties and I'd be at the piano and she'd be singing. And then I did a concert, a series of concerts with Patti Lapone at the Westwood Playhouse by UCLA and Rosie came a time or two and we'd go across <laughs> to the hotel across the street and, and again at the piano, we're all singing. So it was, so I knew her. And then one day, Fran Weisler, the, the legendary Broadway producer called me and said, darling, we're gonna do Grease together and we, I want you to see if Rosie O'Donnell can sing. And I thought, Wow, I actually know what she sounds like because <laughs> been doing the thing, you know, the piano bar, right? Yeah. So she said, but she's going to come over to your house, and you tell me if she could play Rizzo in our Broadway production of Grease. And I said, okay, you know. So Rosie comes over, and knock, knock, knock. I come in. She's like rolling her eyes, like, okay, let's do this. So we go to the, we go to the piano, this very piano. Oh, and, really? Uh, and 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 uh, I said, we go through worst things I could do. And she sings Which, it. Of course, she knows every word too. Of course, she already knows it. She's like ready to go on the next day. So <laughs> she she sang through it, and it was okay. You know how she sings. She's like does her thing. It's fine, but you know. So I so she left, and I called Fran. I said she was wonderful. She's gonna be great. <laughs> and so we've been friends ever since then because I had her back from the beginning. And then and, we and then we were on the road, you know, for six months pre uh, prior to Broadway, say, right. Yeah. And, and, so then, we, and then on Broadway for how long? Well, the show ran for five and a half years, but she was how only in did a, you stay with it? Because there I, was a I whole revolving a, door of Rizzo's. Yeah. Well, I stayed with it for about four or five months on Broadway. And then I was the music supervisor. So I was able to get out of the pit and somebody else came in the pit and conducted. And and uh, so then I would put the new people in. And yes, the revolving door of our, you know, Lucy Lawless and Brooke Shields and and Linda Blair and Maureen, Maureen yeah. and yeah, Sheena Easton. I mean, we had, it was crazy, the Rizzo's that we have. And that was sort of the first time that that sort of stunt casting happened, you know, just to keep the thing going. And now, of course, the Weisslers still do it with Chicago. And they were, they were, they, they were, were until March. Yeah, I know. They are, uh, and the, the Rizzo's didn't stay a long time. A lot of them, it was really brief. Yeah, two or three or four months, you know, whatever yeah. it could be, but it was always overlapping. And then with teen angels like Jennifer Holiday and Al Jarreau oh, and right. Chubby Checker, and, you know, these, uh, there were other roles in the show that we could have a star. So it might say, you know, for eight, eight weeks only, Chubby Checker in Greece. And then Rizzo was played by, X person who was the cover or somebody who would come in who was great, uh, but the but the teen angel became the star for those weeks. And then we had, you know, Danny's and we had Joe Piscovo play Vince Fontaine. And we always had oh, wow. somebody, you know, we were plugging in or Dodie Goodman as Miss Lynch, which was wild. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that. Oh, well, that would Crazy. be something to go to. Crazy. This is a huge um, chapter in the book. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Um, who was the best of the Rizzos? I mean, let's say vocally, who was the best? Well, Sheena Easton. I mean, who can sing like that? That's no, crazy. No. That was, okay. I mean, she comes to mind, but we had some good ones, but we had a lot of actors who sang, if you know what I mean. So right. Well, I remember Lucy in. Law. I didn't know that Lucy Lawless sang as well as she does. And how fun is she? She's oh, amazing. She's the most fun. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Super. Um, 
And I remember, I me remember seeing Maureen, who was not quite the singer that I wanted her to be, but who was so endearing on stage. She Com probably would have made a better Sandy. Complete. Well, but then the singing for Sandy was her much. More. I mean, the, the yeah. way we had, you know, and you know, Sutton Foster was our first Sandy on the road. Uh, the Broadway tour. Oh, I didn't remember that. Amazing, yeah. And Megan Mullally was in that tour. Megan, yep, Megan, singing Freddie. Our Man. friend uh, Sam Harris was in it. Sam Harris, yep, Susan Billy Wood. Porter. Billy Porter. Um, that original cast was crazy. That was It crazy. really was. And were you part of, I remember when that tour, um, they did like this big splash announcement on Miss America. Do you remember that? Sort of. And I don't even know if they had like a live band. I'm sure they didn't. It was probably some canned music. Rosie wasn't even in it. They had a, a big girl, like they were doing We Go Together and it was sort of announcing the production. It was the tour, announcing the uh, tour. I think like it was the Sally's Brothers. Tour. Sally's yeah. Brothers did the tour and Adrian Zamed. And yeah, it was just, but I do remember that time. It really, because you and I, we've come from the world where, you know, in Boston, we would get these people in the summer. You'd get Debbie Reynolds and Irma LaDuce and you'd right. get Julia right. Prout in things. So this sort of brought that summer stock kind of feel to Broadway. Absolutely. And, you know, in St. Louis in the summer of 76, I saw Carol Channing do Hello, Dolly, Yul Brenner do The King and I, Zero Mustel do Fiddler and Angel Lansbury do Mame. I mean, it was it was a wet dream. It was fantastic. And two years before, Bernadette yeah. Peters and, and Robert Preston in Mac and Mabel, which in Oh, come four. on. I you know. Wanted for you to see it. I know. <laughs> Patty LaPone you know, and Baker's wife. I mean, it was not. Wow. It Did was you ever talk to Patty about that? Of course. I first met Patty on a cruise ship in no. 85. No, okay, go. Yeah, out of uh, sailing out of Fort Lauderdale, and she came in to do her show. It was there were two celebrities on that first cruise of mine as a band leader on the Fair Sea, and the celebrities were Cab Calloway and Patty Lapone. And I'm not even kidding. And wow. I was like, "What is happening? This is insane." But Patty brought in her music to Meadowlark, of course, in the mm -hmm. key of E, which I knew already, and I knew how to play it already. And she was like, "Who are you?" <laughs> like, oh and God. for people who don't know, Meadowlark is a bitch to play. It's you're bitch. you're playing yeah. you're playing faster and, and longer and than the know. singers. Correct. Yeah. Oh, correct. Way hard to play, but, but you can't so, just sit down and play it if you no, don't. Know. In fact, that would have been a nightmare. But because I knew it, <laughs> you had so much fun, and I have a videotape of that show. Oh, and you I, see, I, that's the thing. You got to get out your. Tape. I need to transfer to you know this MP4 medium, and I will. Well, it's funny you bring up tapes because last night before, you know, it was around like 4.30, I couldn't sleep. And I, you know, I always think to myself, what do I want to talk to the person that's going to be on the next day about? And I always think of like 20 things afterwards. Ah, uh, right. Okay. So very clear. I, I have all the Rosie shows on tape as well. And I have them cataloged. Thankfully, wow. and most most of the things that are cataloged are at my parents because my place in L.A. or Florida, you know, I have things everywhere, but they're yeah. numbered. And I remembered a moment from, I believe, the first week of the shows Wow! that that I said, I don't know if I could find this tape. But it was when I fell in love with you, because this oh. is not something easy to do. Do you have any idea what I'm going to bring up? I don't yet. Okay. I imagine it's something where I came in playing the piano for something. I imagine. You were playing the piano for something, yes. Yeah. So this is, I don't know, maybe like day three or day four. And you can tell by the camera work that it's all completely on impromptu. There is right. no re preparation is it, for is this. Is it Meryl Streep? No. Oh. No. Uh, and it's, uh, but it, uh, it is somebody that you wouldn't expect and they decide to sing something that you wouldn't expect, A, you wouldn't expect, and B, you would not expect John McDaniel to know. Okay. So since you probably haven't seen this in a very long I've time. I probably have never seen it. Go okay, on. here we go. Hit it. Please. A little distracted. What is it? I think I see a famous person in our audience. You're kidding. Who is it? I believe it is Dennis DeYoung from Styx, although I could be hallucinating. Wow. Is it Dennis DeYoung from Styx? I cannot believe oh it. God. Dennis DeYoung. <laughs> Cool. I have all your records. What are you doing in the audience? Can we give him a mic? Do we have a mic to give Dennis DeYoung someone? Is poor Dennis DeYoung has to scream. I don't want him to ruin his voice. Sorry, there you go. 
Here we Dennis, go. what are you doing in the audience? Um, watching your show, which is uh, the best new show on TV. Aww. <laughs> nice you. Are you touring? What are you doing? Are you touring? Yes, uh, I'm here with Sticks. We played Jones Beach Sunday. We're playing the Garden State uh, tonight, so uh, that's what I'm here what? for. Would you like me to do a little stick song for you now? I <laughs> I'd love it. We don't have, you know, you, John, you know, I know, Which my one? favorite one, you know this song? Babe, I'm leaving. You know that song? Uh. You're the first one, and you just played right along. I love you. Hey, I'll come, I, I Maybe come we could do Come Sail Away. I'm ready. I can come back tomorrow. Will you, will you be a guest? Great. Will you come back and be a guest? Absolutely. Will you bring all the sticks, guys? I'll bring, I'll bring the sticks and the, and, and the stones and the pebbles and everybody. Dennis D. Young, ladies and gentlemen. You know, this is the greatest job I have. Oh, oh my God. God, that was crazy. I mean, what a bit of magic. Again, you can't plan that. That was crazy. And first, I would who never wear a know white like that you are sitting there saying, Do I know a stick song? Well, I was so happy he yelled out, Key of D. Thank I God, mean, that, that you know, was very helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> uh, and again, people should know. I mean, you couldn't plan that. No way. No way. We, there were so many things like that. So many people who just started singing, you know, out of nowhere, and we just sort of you know, insinuated our way into their performance. It was super fun. Well, that, as a musician, I know that is a talent, not just to you for your whole band, because you've got to keep them going. You've Correct. got to lead them, yeah. but you have to trust that they're going to be able to come in, and hopefully band, in the right key. Correct. That band was amazing. We're still family. We still love each other so much. We were just a unit, you know, for that whole six and a half year run. Um, Did it change at all during no. the years? Wow. No. It was very, 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 we knew every show was like a major gift. It was like a beautiful thing. And if you could feel it, like it was so much fun to go and do oh. and exhausting, but you can't complain about that because that was, it was an extraordinary thing to be a part of. Truly. Oh, and, well, and again, I think that, you know, like I said, this sticks show is one of the first shows. And um, I remember maybe the second week that, um, Another friend of ours whose name has just popped out of my head, Caroline the City. Johnny, help me. Oh, Caroline Ray. No, 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 oh, no, no. Oh, no, no Malcolm Getz. Malcolm Getz. Oh, Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm. Who was on Caroline the City. And he started singing, like doing a share impersonation. Yes, and you yes. just jumped. And I think that was like the second week. I'm like, yeah. that's what this show is going to be. It's yeah. a loose never whatever knew. happens. You never knew it was going to happen. We made a record together years later, Malcolm and I. Super proud. Oh, really? Of yeah. Called I The Journey know. Home. It's beautiful. He's oh. terrific. He's really oh. great. It's so talented. I remember um, I when I moved to L.A., one of the things that happens is um, when you meet with agents in particular, and I was acting at the time and doing stand-up, and they want to know who has a role on TV that you could do. And, of course, you want to say, I could do anything. What do you right. know? Any of them. But, name one. Yeah. But, you know, they want you to, like, go somewhere and they want something very specific. Like, they could say a Matthew Perry type because Chandler was big at that point and quirky and whatever. And yeah. I, they said like that. And I went, you know, I don't know if you've seen Caroline the City, but Malcolm gets a uh, Richard is because he was moody and quirky and funny. And I liked that. And the woman said to me, I don't know who that is. Could you name somebody famous? I'm like, well. 
Can't tell. Yeah. It's a big show. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I said this, you know, I said this story, uh, yes, uh, Tuesday, but it just bears very quick, uh, repeating apropos oh. of Dennis DeYoung, yeah. which is when I got back to stand up May 15 years ago, uh, after the column had been doing well. And I said, let's go on the road. And I'd been invited to the Bailiwick theater in Chicago, which you nice. know. And they have two theaters in there. And somebody said to me, um, you know, take the smaller room. It's more intimate, like 75 people. The other room's like 200 people. I said, great. So I take this gig and they say to me, I said, who's in the next room? They said, it is a, a musical production of the Phantom of the Opera written by Dennis DeYoung. Oh. So I'm thinking to myself, what? I don't think I should be in this place because Dennis DeYoung's big and Phantom of the Opera. What the hell am I going to do? <laughs> anyway, so they tell me I'm on the marquee. And of course, I'm running late, as I often do. It happens. And I, <laughs> and I get there. And this is a picture of the marquee that I took that day. Hunchback Billy Masters. <laughs> kicks going fast. <laughs> so it was Hunchback, not Phantom? Yeah. No, oh, I'm sorry. It was Hunchback and Notre Dame. Did I say yeah, Phantom? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. Hunchback yes. Billy Hunchback Master. Billy Masters. So oh, now I think I've got to do the whole show yes, like Hunched so Over. Good. And that I just, you know, so people good. were embarrassed for me. And I said, you just gave me 20 minutes of material. Exactly. You know, I just kept lumbering so, along. So much better. Oh, it was great. Um, <laughs> so speaking of sticks, see, look at this, Johnny. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Johnny oh, no, is. Uh, no, I'm not scared. I do. I do know where you're going. You know exactly where I'm going. Uh, Johnny has uh, written a new musical, uh, which is premiering next week online, next a virtual 16. next Friday, yeah. a virtual premiere online for people to see called Sticks and Stones. Speaking of sticks, um, and stones, he just said. I it. know. So I know. And so uh, John McDaniel wrote the music. Yeah. And uh, and uh, we should tell people really who's in it. The bigger one. It. I mean. Tell people well, who's in this cast. The queen of all things, Audrey McDonald is. Come in. on. Honestly, who, I mean, six Tony Awards in how many categories? I don't think anyone's ever won in those Nobody four, has ever four won different them. categories, right? So she. And uh, she's still young. She can keep uh, winning forever. She, absolutely. I love her. So we've been friends forever. And she, and I asked her to do it. And she said, I want to be a part of this. Because she loves, of course, Born This Way Foundation, which Lady Gaga and her mom founded, which helped young people. Um, mm -hmm. And Broadway Cares, which is an amazing organization in New York that is helping folks through, you know, all, all, for years and for decades, actually. But now with the pandemic, helping COVID um, folks out in such uh, perfect ways. And so it, it really feels uh, it feels great. And Audra sings one of the big songs and she cannot phone it in like she at least, yeah. although she's doing it on her phone. <laughs> she can't phone it in <laughs> because she is so brilliant. That it's yeah. it comes alive, and honestly, I've never heard her sing a song of mine before, and it's the most one of the most thrilling things uh, ever. So um, it's okay. it's worth checking in. And Tell we people have what the story is. So it's this it's the biblical story of David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. And we frame it in a schoolyard and it addresses teen bullying, which is a huge right. problem. Being a kid today, I wouldn't really want to be one. But, you know, kids are tough on each other. And our anthem is choose to be kind. And that really is um, a, a message that I think we need to hear now. Like our we're being led by an administration that knows nothing about this, that it is completely the opposite. Uh, and so I think I think it's a it's a good message today. So we're we're excited to uh, and we have Javier Munoz, you know, who's who's yeah. Broadway's Hamilton after Lynn, you know, and um, yep. and Michael Kilgore who's one of the great singers and George Salazar from Be More Chill. Oh, Chile. I love George. <laughs> He's out in L.A. Uh, working, yeah. starting shooting something now. And but again, isn't that the, the 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 silver lining to all of this is that you don't have to be in the same place. We have actually figured out how to work together with thousands of miles between us. It act, you know, it's a weird thing that we're living in a time where people are trying to distance themselves and bully other people. And what it's done for many of us is brought us closer together. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we, we may be far apart, but we are finding ways of coming together. And this concert is a way of doing that. In fact, we opened video submissions for kids who have had their high school shows canceled, their college shows canceled, summer oh, camps. Yeah. And we got a, over a thousand submissions from kids all around the world. We have kids in the show from New Zealand and from Italy 
And uh, it's, it's insane. And so we have 135 kids from all over America and the world. And our finale will include all of those people. And it's, it's, uh, it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever, I've ever been a part of. And I'll give people the address. I'll type it up as well. Oh, great. Yeah, so it will be on broadwayworld.com as well as broadwaycares.org. <clears throat> and that sort of takes you to their YouTube link. And, um, and we hope people will watch and donate. They're great causes. And uh, we are super, super proud of it. And I should say that, um, you know, these are also organizations that have been providing so much entertainment during this pandemic. Um you have been doing a show of your own as well. Do I have it here? I do. You've been yes, doing do. these, these Sunday teams. I do it every month now. Yeah. For yeah. between Mother's Day and Father's Day, I did seven weeks of every week. And yeah, I, that was too much. It was a lot. I mean, I love when you and I first started talking about this, and you said, Well, how many times are you doing it a uh, week? Yeah. And I said, Well, when Seth brought it up to me, he said, I'm doing it twice a day. And I said, Okay, I'm not doing that. I'll do <laughs> twice a week. And you said said, well, I'm not doing that. I'll do once a week. I said, Johnny, do less because you can always add. It's hard to yeah. go back. Well, I found when I was doing it weekly, I do the show on Sunday. I'm so happy. It went so well. People really loved it. Thousands of views. Like the Mother's Day show has been seen like almost 6,000 times. Yeah, it's, it's really, that's exciting. But then, so Monday, I sort of, okay, Monday, I'm like remembering how nice it was. And then by Tuesday, I'm like, I have a show in five days. What am I going to do? You know what I mean? So, and it's a full, yeah. you know, it's a 45 minute set of singing and playing and, and doing songs that I love and requests and stuff. So, but once a month is perfect. So November yeah. 1st oh, I think so. is the next uh, show two days before November 3rd. Oh yeah. It's a good day. Yeah. Good day. And people can see them. They are uh, repurposed online on Facebook. Are you still doing them on YouTube? I am. Well, I'm starting to navigate to navigate. I'm starting to migrate. <laughs> Stuff over yeah. to YouTube and I have a new YouTube channel which you can find if you type John McDaniel and Helen Reddy because I just posted oh. an arrangement that I did for her in 2014 bless her heart RIP yeah. um, that I'm so proud of and and so I, I am moving the content over to YouTube because I feel like it's um, a great Easier place to, find. to put it all together you know yeah yeah, I find that, you know, this goes out on Facebook and YouTube and it goes out simultaneously. And what I notice is while I have, you know, like 6,000 friends on Facebook, YouTube is where people stumble on it. The searching is easier. Uh, uh -huh. It lives forever. It lives forever. Right. YouTube. Exactly. However long um, that is. I know. Well, yeah, I know. Well, Johnny, you know, that's the other thing I thought to myself when this started. I said, you know, if this is the beginning of the end, you know, like P excavators go to Pompeii and they can find the remains and they say, oh, when the pandemic hit, this woman was making bread. I said, what do these shows tell people that when the pandemic hit, John and Billy were talking about Helen Reddy? Correct. That's correct. And we always will. <laughs> and, you know, and if that's how I go out, it's okay with me. She was great. I met her several times. I think I met her once with you, possibly. But I, I remember meeting saw. her with, yeah, I, I remember meeting her with, with music Steph. show. She, she did a lot of benefits. Yeah. Yeah. She was great. Oh, that's right. She did the, she what was song Hollywood was it? The, Candle on the Water. That, yeah. Thank you. From Pete's Dragon. Pete's Dragon. That's how I was Amazing. trying to think of. But right. Betty Buckley was in that show, and my niece, Mary Beth Black, was in that show. And, and I remember saying to you, her voice sounds exactly the same. The same. I know. She sounded like she was 20. And I had you seen know, her when I was a little kid um, at Six Flags Over Mid-America in St. Louis. And oh, her, you have such a glamorous life, John McDean. Oh, so glamorous. <laughs> her, her concert just went through me like... Oh my gosh, I've heard you on the radio and now you're here. It was one of those first like moments that you realize, oh, it's like you can have this live in person thing. And she was that person for me. So then all the years later that I got to work with her and she was on Rosie and, and, but just an amazing career, you know, beautiful lady. You have worked with so many iconic people, and I'm sure many people who you saw as a kid or that you idolized as a kid. Was there, you know, because it's so hard to play favorites, but is there somebody that was like the pinch me moment of all pinch me moments? Well, there's a couple. I got to work a one-nighter benefit with Carol Channing, which was a big deal because, again, I'd had a brush with her when I was a little boy going to get my Hello Dolly record signed at Famous Bar downtown St. Louis. <laughs> 
And in fact, quick story, I was in line and and this, this person behind me said, oh, go up to the front. And so I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. So I took my record up to the front and I got before I knew it, I was like being whooshed into this elevator with all these people. And I looked up and Carol Channing was standing in the elevator with me. Oh my God. Like, hello, how are you? And I said, <laughs> I'm, you know, and she said, oh, you come with me. And she took really good care of me and she signed my record. Oh, you want to see it? Hold on. I do, I do. You're gonna see my, um, you're gonna see my shorts, but- That's okay. Um, I have seen your shorts. So this, so this is literally uh, what Look she- it. Oh, wow, yeah. With love, Carol Channing. And then last December, I had the distinct pleasure to have Mr. Jerry Herman signed this. Oh my God, Jerry Herman. Just well, he, was living, he was living in Florida at the end. Yeah. Cause I remember that was the last time I saw him was in Florida. Yeah. It, he, he just wasn't doing so well. And yet when he would talk about his music, he would light up even at the end. Yeah. He was even like a kid at 88. Yeah. He was yeah. Because yeah. it was so funny when I first saw him and I think he was like, 84 85 and i said oh sometimes I, you don't want to see these people at that point the minute he started talking music and yeah. realized i wanted to talk music he yeah. was like a kid well and i went over I, to visit him with sorry with uh, with clea blackhurst you must know clea and so clea is a favorite of his and so we had so we we laughed and scratched. why was clea a favorite that's well, an interesting well she had been in some shows some reviews of his um down oh, here in okay. florida and he got to know her and he just felt like she was, you know, the real deal as she is. But you know, she's a little bit from another time. She can be very, um, she can be very, uh, she can kind of take you away to that. You know, I, her Ethel Merman show, I just fell in love with. Oh wow, well, she's so great. Yeah, she's great. Um, um, I, you know, I've told, uh, you know, 90 of the uh, pretend to the stories I tell, I feel like I've told a million times, but then you realize not everyone watches every show. So, um, but I remember being with Carol Channing at the reopening of the El Portal oh. and, um, which was a night that like Donald O'Connor was there and Carol, and he was doing something from his vaudeville show that he used to do with his kid, his parents and his brothers and sisters when he was a kid. Amazing. And so I was backstage helping Carol Channing in the wings and she was so frail and so old and hunched over and shuffling along. And I said, Oh my God, this woman's never going to make it on stage. And I get her in position and she's just like sitting and I say, I'll help you up and, gingerly you lifted her she got to the side of the stage and the minute the spotlight hit her the arms were up she's dancing and singing uh, and the minute the light got off of her back boom yeah it was, all, it was exactly like that exactly like that she lived for that that audience gave her that juice that that pulsed through her brain her brain her body and uh ignited her brain and it was it was extraordinary to watch her do that stuff. We did some stuff. Um, Diamonds are a girl's best friend from gentlemen prefer blondes. And, mm -hmm. and that stuff, it was so great in, in a beautiful, uh, beautiful beaded sort of what her, one of her, I think it's in the Smithsonian even now. Um, oh, it might be. You're yeah, right. It might be. I think so. Um, but, yeah. She was, you know, she, that memory of seeing that really there are people that really come to life on stage was so important for me because it made me realize two things. First off is that you can't judge somebody sitting with civilians because that's not where they live. Right. But the other thing is, is that she needed to be on stage and got as much out of it as the audience did. Exactly. And therefore we are getting it because we see that she is getting, you know, it's a real, real uh, symbiotic relationship with the audience. Yeah, there are people, you know, there's so few of them left, like Carol Cook. And, you know, I, yeah. I mean, we, you and I have been friends with a lot of our older ladies. Somebody just texted me and asked, um, did you ever work with Elaine Stritch? This person said, I was always afraid to meet her because I loved her so much, but heard difficult stories about her. She would not have disappointed me. And yes, not only did I work with her, but we were actually friends. She, uh, oh, were you? I conducted a, a revival of Pal Joey in LA that Dixie Carr starred in. And Elaine did her role of Melba that she'd done in 1950. Oh, yeah. Now this was, yeah, Zip. This was the uh, early, uh, like 1990, 1991. Okay. 
And it was an incredible experience. And she, you know, she'd come into rehearsal and she'd go over in the corner and strip basically and put on her outfit. Like, no, didn't care. Fantastic. Amazing stories. I would always bring my lunch because she did too. And we could sit outside and chat about oh, story. Wow. And she was such an amazing lady. And she was living in, uh, staying in LA, but she didn't drive. So I was sometimes her date and I would come pick her up and we'd at the Hotel Bel Air and we'd go to these amazing parties, you know, she was invited to. And of course, it was absolutely ridiculously fun. And then years later in New York, when I lived and she, then she was at the Carlisle, um, I subbed a few times for Rob Bowman, who was her longtime oh, music I love director her. and, you know, played some gigs with her and, I mean, I, I love her more. I, I, I can't tell you how much I love her. I yeah. think of her often, and I'm so grateful that I got to know her. I only met her twice. Once at the after she brought um, Liberty the Liberty Show to yep. um, Amundsen, to the yep. Amundsen. It was opening night, and there were people swarming her, and it was very much a hike. Get out, you know, very quick. But then a young fan who of my call, I mean, he was a young gay kid, was like 15 years old. Yeah. And you gotta remember that was a different time in the 90s and even beginning of the 2000s because gay kids didn't have any sort of role models. They may not have known any other gay people. So if they would stumble onto my column, they'd start writing me because they just wanted to talk to somebody. Right. And this kid was, um, um, had gotten to do some local theater. And one of the things was a masterclass with Elaine Stritch. Nice. And he wow. sent me so many pictures and he said that he learned so much from her and he also learned very colorful vocabulary. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, that's how truck drivers talk. Oh, okay. I see. Um, oh, somebody asked, uh, I'm late getting here. Have you talked about taboo yet? We haven't I talked guess. about taboo. No, we haven't. Um, uh, so my, I had seen Taboo in London, uh, the original version of the show, which yeah. I love actually. Yeah, and I, I say, I say that with, with some hesitation because our good friend, Charles Bush wrote the book for the Broadway, the Broadway version, which yeah. I thought just you know, it was more theatrical, but it also was more convoluted and it was, you could never make, you know, I've learned over the years that when you fix one thing, you create 10 other problems. 100%. And, um, but it was an amazing cast. Raul Esparza gave one of the great performances and you and Morton was great. Yeah. So tell me your experiences with it. That's a show that I wish we'd gone out of town because for, for yeah. the very reason you're saying, we we previewed on Broadway, you know, on 45th Street and we were not quite ready. The end of act one started as the big messy Part, and we sort of tried to fix that, but then that, as you say, impacted things later in the show and earlier. So we had to fix, and and we were just tearing our hair out trying to figure out what should we fix, what's the most important thing to fix, because there were beautiful moments in it. I mean, I'm so proud of that cast recording. We, oh, yeah. uh, the songs, George's songs, he's he's just amazing, and I produced that and with the performers the you had. I mean, it was you and Morton's introduction to New York, and he was extraordinary. extraordinary. And the girl, what was the girl? The big girl, uh, Liz McCartney, amazing. Liz McCart oh, and Sarah yeah. Barry was incredible in that. Um, so many people, really. Carrie Shields. We did a ten-year uh, reunion at Fifty Four Below some years ago, and everybody got together, and it was great. Really, there's a great documentary. I don't know uh, what is it called. Is it like the Road to Broadway or something where they With follow those four, four shows? shows. <clears throat> Avenue and Q, I, Wicked, yeah. Taboo, and uh, Carolina, Carolina Change. Change. Right. And I really? just saw it recently when the pandemic began. You just start pulling things out, and it is a heartbreaking documentary because you see all the work that goes into something and how it can just be over overnight Evaporate. for something that has nothing to do with anything. Yeah. It could just be timing. It could be somebody at a bad dinner and they didn't have a good uh, experience watching it and they tear it apart. It could be Rosie was being sued during that time. That's right. That's awesome. Magazine. <clears throat> and a, that was a distraction as well. It's a, it's just unfortunate that it didn't get a better yeah. chance. I think it wants to be done again. I know that the creators want to do it again and they have ideas about it. People ask me all the time, where can I get the rights? I want to do taboo at my theater. And I'm like, they won't give the rights. We have asked. Yeah. So yeah. that's good. I think maybe 
maybe there's a way to fix it and make it, um, you know, feature those songs a little bit more and, and make the story clear so you can really follow Because George has an amazing story. And the Lee oh, Bowery yeah. stuff is so interesting. It's just hard. I mean, a musical is hard. That there's a lot of moving parts. And the thing is, is that, you know, when you beefed up one person's part, something else had to give. And I remember watching the documentary and seeing Raul so frustrated saying, OK, we're opening in a week. Do we have a frozen version of this show? <laughs> <laughs> we don't. And I, I, I think the very first time I met Raul, I was at one of the early run throughs somebody invited invited me to the show i went with david drake and we were at joe allen's afterwards and raul had had a particularly difficult run through that day. okay and he but i i it was the second time i had seen him the first time didn't as impress me as much as this because sometimes in a problem show a performance really stands out and um he, I went up to him and I said, you were so brilliant tonight. And every problem aside, you were giving a yeah. world-class performance. Yeah. And he was very touched by that because I think when you're caught in that minutia, it's like you can't even see. Yeah, you're like a hurricane. It's all going on around you and you're doing the best you can to keep your head above the water and doing your thing. And so, yeah, it's great to hear that. Yeah, and uh, I, I felt for him. And seeing the documentary is just heartbreaking. Another question. Have you and John ever dated? Ah, uh, Kenny. We didn't date. We slept together. But oh, we didn't date. God. Well. <laughs> but what time is it? I know, exactly. <laughs> there was a little heavy petting no, in Boston. Married. You remember that? All right. Well, it wasn't yesterday. Whatever. Um, do you remember that concert in Boston? Of course with I the, do. How much girls was that? Was that? That was Faith, Andrea McArdle, and who? Maureen, McGo Maureen McGovern. Oh, Maureen McGovern. And John McKechnie. Oh, and John McKechnie. It was four girls, four. That's yes. right. What was that theater called? The Not the, the Wilbur. Wilbur. It was Wilbur. the Wilbur. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then we walked down to Club Cafe and had dinner afterwards. That was so much fun. And Andrea McArdle is crazy. No. I know. I didn't know she was crazy till I met her that night. And you said, you haven't even seen the craziness. <laughs> I love her, though. But she seems like she's a lot of fun to be on the road with. She is. She's a lot of fun anywhere. Um, <laughs> I do. I do love her. But oh, my gosh, if we weren't being watched by any other people, I would tell you. I know, I know. There were things, that, I do there things you told me that night, I remember. Again, I'm a kid. We go to New York. I'm in the-, the It's Annie. Annie. Of the Alvin Theater, and it's Annie, and it was a life changing. That was a beautiful show, and she's she's great. I adore her. And what's That's all I'm saying? I'll give you dirt on other people, though. I know, I know, no, I know. One time, no, look, you give John a martini, and he'll tell you stories. So oh that. my god. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to see. We get so many. Qu oh, okay. So I didn't know. I found a clip. I didn't know. You've played, as we've said, for a lot of people over the years. True. I found a clip that staggered me. And I have a story about this person as well. Oh. But this is a really, really, really young John McDaniel. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so sexy, by the oh. way. I mean, not that you're not cute now, but my God, you are gorgeous. Wow. You have any idea where I could go with this? Is it, like does her name start with Y? It does indeed. <laughs> okay. So, well, uh, I'm going to show the clip and then we'll, because uh, I know we'll both have stories to tell about this 1, woman. 1,000%. What I, what, what I want people to notice, <laughs> if you're a musician, I have a, oh God. what you will notice as a musician is that this singer has a very casual relationship with the downbeat. Oh, <laughs> well said. And so she's heard of them, but yeah. So when John will start the melody and either she'll come in with the melody, the next measure, or sometimes halfway through a measure and he has to frantically give the band. And now because, <laughs> oh, we're going back. And it happens. Yeah. And it happens a lot. Okay. There's just a clip of John McDaniel and the legendary Ema Sumac. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha 
I'm dead. I'm out. Okay. Good night, everybody. See, it's fast and slow simultaneously. How can we top that? That was oh, <laughs> okay. she was incredible. She, that was in Paris, France, by the way. That was Paris. And so yeah. I don't know if you remember where you and I went to dinner after the Four Girls Four concert at Club Cafe. I remember. I saw Ema Sumac in the dress. Well, I think oh all the dresses. Oh, my God. And then she would, wasn't so thrilled with that, so we took a second one. I don't know. I think I look better in that one. But Amazing. did the did the breast ever just come out? Where Did they ever go in? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. So, so can I just tell you a quick Ema story? <laughs> You're going to tell me a lot of Ema stories. <laughs> Because we, you know, we toured Europe, we Brussels, France, we were in Paris, and uh, one of my favorite restaurants was, and maybe still is if it's there, is uh, Julienne, which is at the very end of the Rue Saint-Denis, which is where all the porn shops are and the girls standing in the doorways hoping that you'll come join them and go upstairs. So here's Ima Sumac. In her, she had a fur that she had gotten, I think, in China decades before and it was very very glamorous and fabulous and she was all done up in her turban and her eyes and her you know when we were and she was absolutely convinced that everyone would think that she was the madam and so <laughs> we so she was afraid she was like keep walking keep walking they will stop me they will stop me and i was like are you you don't mean because of Ema. No, no, they'll think I'm the madam. So we duck in had a wonderful dinner came back ran down Rue Sandini one more time uh, to get home. Hilarious. Amazing. I just, Indelible. I, I've seen, cause I saw her when she was in Boston, I saw her maybe three times. I had been working with Eartha Kitt and Eartha said, Oh, you, we, I should send you up with my good friend, Ima. And I'm like, this is my, I'm going to end up with Eartha Kitt, Ima. Soon Eartha, after. Ima, Ima, Eartha. Yeah, and it was, <laughs> and so, um, I got to meet her and we corresponded several times and we were going to work together and then we didn't. But what I saw was she puts her musicians through torture with her tempo changes and yelling and banging on the piano at times. To, yeah, she wasn't always sure how to, yeah. Yeah, how to communicate what she wanted. So she just, in her frustration, because I think Moises, who was her husband and arranger and orchestrator and conductor for all those years when she was a, really a big deal, in the 50s. Oh, she was huge. Yeah, she was a huge star. And so she always had him to just do it. And then so the, the conductors like me later in, you know, in her later years did have to deal with a little bit of like, what are you doing? That's crazy. Don't be crazy. And again, you're starting a measure and then I'll just come in when I come in and then you'll just follow me. And you do. Yeah, and whatever. also, I love watching your hands because you play not like a club pianist, but like a trained pianist. I mean, I watch hand position all the time. Yeah. So obviously, were you trained classically? I start, well, my, my mother was my first piano teacher when I was five, although music had been in the house since um, as long as I was alive. But mom taught me piano and she still teaches and she's teaching on Zoom now. And uh, she's amazing. Yeah. But, uh, but th I think that I always sort of knew how to play. Like I didn't practice enough or often. And I think to myself, what if I had actually practiced what kind of dexterity, what kind of crazy stuff. But I, I, just uh, you had a great ear and I could sort of combine the reading and the ear and sort of make it work. Yeah, that's something that I think um, as a kid, I started on the piano playing by ear. And then when I learned to read, if you, again, the ear, if you don't keep training it, you will lose that skill. And uh, it's sort of like perfect pitch. I think as a kid, I had perfect pitch. Now I have variable pitch because I just, because I've been on so many pianos that are concert pitch, standard pitch, no pitch, and no you pitch. just have yeah. to adjust. Oh, <laughs> But I, you also, how did you get the job with Ema? How did that um, come in? Alan Eichler asked me to do that. You know, Alan. Yeah, I did. And, yeah. um, Alan he was, was the one that told me you were playing on these videos. Oh, my and God. And I went, Bonnie? Brilliant. I have no idea. Brilliant. Yeah, he was uh, working with her, and 
I had done some other stuff with him and um, it, it just, it, he, he was the connection. How long were you with her? We did that European thing and a couple of other gigs in LA and that was about it. And it was near the end, it was 1990, it was near mm -hmm. the end of her working, I think, although of course, Alan knows. Yeah. So you weren't, you weren't in Boston with her when I saw her. No, I wonder what year that would have been. Yeah, I don't. She had done the ballroom. She did uh, David Letterman and Boston all like in one little cluster. She was We're trying, you know, again, I think there was this sort of camp nostalgia that was coming yeah. back. And yeah. she was, you know, she was interesting, although I do remember that um, occasionally people would laugh at her in the audience, which you had to laugh a little bit. And she would it get very extreme. insulted and hurt. Yeah, she was an extreme, you know, look and character and and persona. Um, so that's that's. And she took herself very seriously. She did. She was a real. Um, she had a great ear, and she was. Um, her talent was unique. She had let, like they said, a five octave range. I think it was less, but she had really low notes, and then she had those little bird, chirpy notes at the very tippy top, which were extraordinary. Yeah, but what an experience for you to have done that. Crazy. I can't I, even I imagine. That. Robert L. says, Julienne in San Marino's is named after that restaurant. Okay, so thank you, Robert L. Okay, good to know. People good people know. just uh, giving us information. I can't wait till well, we can travel again and go to Paris. Oh, my God. Anywhere. Well, you've got everywhere. I remember, um, I don't know how long ago, two or three years ago, were you in Russia? You were in Russia just before me. I was. And yeah. what brought you to Russia? I, this, I met this gentleman. Gentleman caller, and so, but he was a theatrical director. And was so, it a real gentleman or a bot? Because I've met those bots. It was not a Russian bot, bot no. All right. But uh, I went there a couple of times to visit and see some. Where theater. was and, he? Uh, what's that? Where was he? What city? Moscow. Well, he lived in Moscow, but we, but he worked. He was would work regionally. So we went to Omsk and we went to. Um, oh gosh, where else did we go? Oh, we went all over. Um, it was gorgeous. I, I went. I guess three years ago, maybe, and just St. Petersburg and Moscow, and it was just extraordinary. It's kind of incredible. It really, I'm so glad I got to go. You know? And the people, I think people should also know, the Russian people are lovely. They know nothing about what's going on. You know, it, it's, it's so interesting that we are living through this pandemic, and you hear of horrible things that are happening in hospitals by the border, and with children and women, and you... You know, I have now such sympathy for people who lived through, during the war in Germany where people would say, well, why didn't you do something? And I'm like, well, here we are. What can we here do? Here we are. We're living it. Yeah. You know, and it, it I, and, and the same with the Russian people. You know, they Russia has a bad rep because of people who run it. But the people there were lovely. And they're also mm -hmm. completely apolitical. Yeah, I met some beautiful people there. Just incredible folks, yeah. especially the, the theater folks that I met. And I'm still friends with on Facebook, and I, I love them very much. Yeah, me too. Again, I was there for um, for musical purposes. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, my God, again, so many questions I have to think. Who? All right, so somebody wants to know, was there somebody that you wanted to work with that you didn't get to? Like they had, they died or you were close? Uh, you know who I've never worked with, who I'm dying to work with sometime is Mick Jagger. I feel like he is such a unique spirit and musician and soul. And I, I just find him so excellent that I got to work with my, you know, Barry Manilow and Billy Joel and all of my heroes, you know, and continue to, to get to work with great people. But Mick Jagger's sort of high on my list of never, they were never on the show. I never got to meet him. Um, I've seen them in concert and I love the stones, but he comes to mind, but I'm trying to think of like a Broadway kind of person. I've been so lucky to work with all of the, the little Lapone and the Tyne Daly and uh, just everyone we talked about and, and feel so lucky to get to know them and work with them. That is, a, that's the thrill of my life. I think. You know, one of the thrills of my life, and I remember telling you this after the fact, and I didn't know you were going to be doing it was when I, uh, it was at the opening night of Catch Me If You Can. Right. And you were music director for that and on stage. Yeah. Yeah. Which we had was the whole so, I mean, it was like sort of this big band kind of setup. Like an old TV, sort of TV uh, variety show kind of a thing. 
which was a great musical, if people don't know it, uh, written by Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, who wrote Hairspray, our yep. very good friends. And start, was it Aaron? Aaron Tveit. Aaron yep. was and Norbert Leo Butts, who won the Tony. Oh, right. I um, mean, I, I, what what an amazing show that was. And that didn't so, really get a, a so fair shake, unfortunately. But, yeah, we were had we opened, you know, before the Tonys, and then we were nominated for a bunch and Norbert won. And then through the summer it was going great. And we were heading into the fall. And the producers looked, Margot Lyon, Rest Her Soul, looked at the books of what's coming up. And the the fall is always difficult. You know, you if you can get through sort of September, you can get into the holidays, and then you're good until January, and then you have to yeah figure it out again for January, February. But they just felt like they, they would close and go out with a bit of a bang instead of trying to hang on and sort of die a death. In, on yeah, it's too bad because it was a great score. So great. And the music was so, I mean, Larry Blank and Mark orchestrated this giant uh, sound, this big band. It was it was great, great fun. And Carrie Butler belting oh, her face off Carrie, and fly, and fly away. Oh, and some of the songs still live on. I know uh, Marilyn May does Butter. What is the song? Butter, Butter out of cream. cream. Butter out of cream. <laughs> yeah. So another great song. And I, uh, yeah, just a uh, fabulous, fabulous yeah. score of people who don't know it. And apparently it has huge life in community theater. Yeah, it's done a lot. As Kids. is Bonnie and Clyde, which I did on Broadway too. Frank oh, did you do that with, the, yeah. with Jer Was Jeremy in it then? Jeremy or did Gordon or San Diego. Oh, okay. I yeah. never, I didn't see that. What was now? What was that show's problem? Well, I think just like Catch Me, it's hard to do a show about criminals because you <laughs> are you're trying to be, you want to love them, and you're like, who am I loving? They're shooting, they're killing everybody. So it's a. I, I have vowed I'm not going to do any more shows about criminals. <laughs> Because you want to love people, you want to root for somebody. I think this is the important thing in a musical. I think you want to root for somebody. You want to follow their story and get behind them. And and it's it, it, the criminality it gets in the way. But it's Frank wrote the most beautiful score um, for Bunny and Clyde, and I orchestrated it and was with the show with Jeff Calhoun, my good friend who directed it all the way through. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, La Jolla and then the Oslo Theater in Sarasota and then Broadway. And it ran for a while. But the thing is, the record is terrific, which I was mm -hmm. happily producing with uh, David Lai and Frank. Um, because the record got out there, high schools and community theaters, and it's done all the time. And I know every time Jeremy Jordan does uh, one of Seth's concerts or any concert, he talks about that and he does a song from it, which is lovely. I don't remember the song name. Jesse Pierce just texted again, Jesse. Hello again, Jesse. Seven Wonders is a jam. Seven Wonders. Beautiful song. Say, all right, I'm going to have to look into it. Um, was there, you know, what was Frank Wildhorn like? Because I met him once when he was with Linda. Yeah. And, um, and I never got a read on him. I didn't know, you know, what he he's was great. Like he's, yeah, he's warm. He's like a big teddy bear. Um, very musical. Very. He's a great collaborator. We had a really good <clears throat> connection and uh, respect for one another. And ideas were flowing. And it was a it was a happy collaboration. I really love Frank. And we text often. And we'll I'll be like, When are we going to do a show together? I want to work with you again. He's like, I know. We'll find the right one. We'll do it. We'll do it. So someday. yeah, he was so hot, and everybody was really like you know, looking forward to all of his shows. And then it was like Jekyll and Hyde was the big thing. And then nothing really could live up to that. Yeah. Yeah. His one, his score for Wonderland, which really just ran for like 10 minutes is fantastic. There's some great songs in that. Yeah. I do. Like, yeah, I, 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 I about the songs, you know? No, I think that's true. I remember when, um, Oh, what was here in Boston? The, um, Neverland speaking of Wonderland, Neverland musical was here. Was it with Maddie Morrison then? I guess it must have been. That could, yeah, I think so. I think I so. Remember. And um, but I remember thinking, oh, this is lovely. But some shows also are lovely and don't necessarily deserve to be in a big theater. Some shows are lovely, but they're not commercial. Yeah, it just depends. I think it depends on how the audience finds the story and finds the experience. And if they have a great experience, they'll tell their friends. If they didn't, they won't. And then, you know. It's just how long can you keep the butts in the seats, really? Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, what was the? I know you were only on Broadway with Greece for like five uh, five months. What was the longest you've stayed on Broadway? 
Um, well, that, that's I sort of don't really conduct eight shows a week anymore. I'm lucky. I'm knocking wood that I, I've gotten to the point where I can orchestrate and put a show together and then let it run. Um, I did conduct Catch Me for that summer. So that was four months. Um, I didn't conduct Bonnie and Clyde. I didn't conduct Brooklyn or Taboo uh, or Anna Get Your Gun, which, you know, with Bernadette Peters and Reba McIntyre. Oh, God, I remember, right. Such a great experience to do the arrangements for that and then um, uh, produce the cast album. That's what I won my Grammy for. And then... Uh, um, and Didn't then you put Susan her. Lucci in? Oh, yeah. You did her put in. Yes. How was that? She's so dear. I love her so much. <laughs> Billy Masters, you just no, I know. You just I love guys. <laughs> I'm just no, I know because I love my Lucci. I do. I act. I actually, we were talking about her doing this. She was going to do the show with her daughter with Liza. Oh, nice. I uh, which her. they may do it at some point. Um, <clears throat> and Reba, and you had Reba. Oh yeah, Reba really. The, Reba was born to play that role. She was great. She was absolutely great. But we had um, we had a lot of you know people play Annie, but nobody. Bernadette was just what a joy to put that revival together with her and to create that. Lost in His Arms is one of my favorite songs in the world, and to make that arrangement for Bernadette to sing on Broadway every night was heaven. Heaven. Well. Speaking of uh, our old divas, I do remember something that you did, which I've seen the video, but I wasn't there. You did a reunion of the original cast of Company. Yes, 1993, now, I think. And that had been how long? So that was 23 25? years. It okay. was from, from the 1970, and then it was uh, we revived with the original cast, uh, first in L.A. with everybody except Merle Louise, who was in London doing, I think, Into the Woods. She couldn't get out of it to come to LA. But then we did two night, two or three performances at Lincoln Center in New York uh, later that year and Mara Louise joined us. So we had every living person. The only person who had passed at that point was Charlie Braswell who played Elaine Stritch's husband in the show. So we had Dean Jones who was re reunited with the original cast and Susan Browning you know, was so great. And, and Donna McKechnie doing TikTok full out which there is video of, I don't know if that's what you're, thinking about but. no no but well i'm thinking i've seen the whole thing and it's oh and again ridiculous. elaine and beth I mean, elaine. Just everybody Crazy. i mean that's the thing is i think that you you know you may have missed like a certain era and yet you're able to recapture it for yourself and for the audience 100 percent. i you love which it doesn't yeah. happen often yeah, I feel so lucky to have had that experience. And I was doing Patti LuPone live at Westwood Playhouse at the same time, rehearsing one, going to do the other. Oh, was that the same this time? Is, yeah, it was absolutely incredible. And so the funny thing about that is uh, she did that, the Westwood Playhouse, before she went to London to do Sunset <laughs> Boulevard. So I was visiting Los, uh, Los Angeles then. I went to see Patti LuPone live. And um, my hairdresser, why doesn't it always come to here? Um, my hairdresser on Jackie Collins had recommended me to go to this hairdresser on Sunset Boulevard. And it was a dive, <laughs> but it was run by uh, this character who knew everybody. So you didn't really go there to get your hair cut, uh, okay. done. You went there basically for the gossip. The and yeah. at the next, the, somebody there who was getting his hair done was Kevin Anderson. Okay. And Kevin Anderson said to me, I'm going off to London to do this musical. I'm not going to be back for years. And I'm like, and we know well, that. We'll right. see. Yeah. So I remember well, afterwards thinking to myself, oh, poor Kevin Anderson. Um, oh. One thing that we haven't talked about, and I think it, it's a, such an extraordinary musical, is Brooklyn. Yes. Speaking of Kevin Anderson, he was he was uh, played Taylor Collins in the Broadway Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. And that is such an underrated score because it's so different and so beautiful. And so, you know, it's like a, a mix of so many things. It really was, yeah. I, I thought, such an original score. It is. When I first heard the music, the first song I ever heard was Raven which the character of Paradise sings in act two. And I just thought, what is this music? This is great. And uh, and I just fell in love with it. In fact, Jeff Calhoun came to my loft in Tribeca and said, I wanna show you this, I wanna play you some songs for the show. And I listened to it and I said, this is so great. We could, you know, why don't we produce this ourselves? And we did. Jeff and I shepherded that show from that meeting 
forward to a workshop on 42nd Street. Oh, wow, which, I didn't know that. Yeah, through which we got the Denver Civic Theater production in Denver, uh, went there. And from that production, we got our four uh, lead producers, Ben Mordecai and his group, Michael Jenkins, uh, to produce the show on Broadway. And Jeff and I were, you know, producers all the way to, uh, and, and that show, that show ran for nine months. That is, yes. you know, that's a, you know, that was not horrible. Um, no, we would have left to run for years. And we well, did have especially a, for a show that people really didn't have like a built-in audience. They actually built that from scratch. Yeah. 100%. We were very grassroots that way. You know, and I think that's one of the great things about the Rosie show was that you guys were really ambassadors for Broadway. You know, you brought Broadway into people's living rooms pretty much every week. We did. We had a sort of an unspoken rule that if you had a Broadway musical running, you were virtually guaranteed a spot on our show to present your show to uh, to the people in you know Ohio and Iowa. And it was a tremendous opportunity, and I did not take that lightly. That was a great, great thing because I knew there were kids out watching. Who, was, who would say to me someday, and they do, oh my gosh, I was in, I'd rush home from school and I'd watch the show and I would see, you know, Sideshow and Titanic and these shows that were running then that they may not have heard of otherwise. Oh, yeah. I think that in that way, it was a lot like the Ed Sullivan show that you were really bringing this because there was no other avenue for these people to be on mass media. Correct. And there still isn't. I mean, once yeah. in a while on The View, it's just not, there's nothing like it. All right, so let's talk about The View. Now, what did you think of Rosie on The View since you brought it up, Johnny? Um, <laughs> actually, you know what? Let's let's do it in two parts. When she was on as moderator, the first run, was that, a, did you think that Rosie being a moderator for a panel show was going to be an effortless fit? Um, I really had no idea. But I think that, I mean, I love her viewpoint and her point of view and, and her humor and uh so I, I enjoyed it. I don't think I was a, an everyday viewer, but mm -hmm. um, just because there were so much, there was so much stuff going on, rehearsals and things. But um, but every time I would catch it, I really enjoyed it. And well, because it was, it did crackle, certainly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that show really has ridden waves, hasn't it, through the years? God. Well, that's when Rosie went back and was just a panelist. In many ways, I thought that was a better fit, even though, again, she's such a big personality. It's hard for her to just sort of be part of the panel. Yeah, maybe not as good that way. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, just interesting. Um, okay, I'm looking at uh list. I know we got to go shortly. So uh, uh, let's talk about It's a Wonderful Life. Oh, the musical with Kathy Lee that we wrote. Yeah. yeah. We, gosh, we tried so hard to get that show on. It's a weird thing. The, the movie rights are public domain, but it's based mm -hmm. on a book that is not. So you have, if you're going to do anything wonderful life, you have to get the rights from the book. And we had a really hard time with, uh, with that process for some reason, and I'll never know why. But we've done some workshops and we hope to do it. She had an idea about doing it uh, as a television event for NBC. Uh, uh, she had that idea a few years oh, ago. Sure. We, and I just saw her in February and we were still talking about it. How can we get this? Because it's a great, she wrote some beautiful lyrics and we have some great songs and we're hopeful. Well, the thing is that I don't think everyone knows is again, because you are a pianist and a band leader and a conductor and a music supervisor and all those things that really you also do compose. We've talked about some of yeah. the things you and, compose. And more all the time. Yeah. yeah. And so what, what gives you the most pleasure or is it whatever you're working on at that moment? It really depends. You know, I love orchestrating other people's music. I love writing. I've written more songs in this pandemic than I ever have before. And I've been really? writing lyrics, which I've, be, I've have a new uh, confidence about. Um, it's Were fun. you mostly a music person and somebody else would provide words? Often. Yeah. In fact, Sticks and Stones, the lyrics are written by my friend, Scott Logsdon, and I just wrote the music, but I, I like writing, uh, you know, songs, the whole thing, the music and the lyrics. It's fun. And I still love collaborating too. I collaborate a lot with my friend, Barb Younger in London. We've written some 
cool things. And who you've done a lot of shows with. My God, Very you well. and Barb have been everywhere. We really there was have. that Beatles show that was so great. Yeah. People should look online. If you go to YouTube and look up uh, Barb Younger with a J, um, yeah. you will see there's really some extraordinary work. You guys have worked together for a while now. We have for for almost a decade, actually. We, we met, she's been coming up, you know, I'm the artistic director at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center's Art, uh, Cabaret mm -hmm. and Performance Conference. And I've had Barb come for the last seven years as a teacher and also to do a show. And then we started, I, I was loving the show she was doing, but I was secretly thinking, gosh, I'd love to sing with her and love to make an arrangement for her. So I did for one of our finale sh uh, shows. And she was like, Ooh, that was good. Let's do more together. And I was like, aha, it's working. <laughs> so, yeah. So then, um, then we did this Beatles collection called come together, which I just posted uh, on my brand new YouTube uh, channel. Just oh. Uh, oh, wow. I, I didn't know. I, I uh, put uh, our come together sort of sizzle reel up on my John McDaniel YouTube uh, today as sort of a throwback Thursday thing. But um but we it's really we, great. It's so great. The arrangements are so good. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we love taking a song apart and putting it back together again. And then we did Sting, you know, the music of Sting uh, mm -hmm. the next couple of years after that. And that's our most recent that we recorded. But we're starting to think about the next one. And there will be a next one. You've put together a lot of shows for people. Um, I, how involved do you get in terms of building a one person show for a cabaret space, for example, because I know you've done it with so many people. I didn't I, was it time daily? You did a show with. Yeah. Just a few. And you put her show together. I think it was yeah. her first. Cabaret. Yeah. She and I put that show together uh, with David Galligan actually directed that too. Yeah. It had a big, uh, a, was a big creative force on that show. Um, a really good friend of ours, he, uh, he put together the stage benefits in LA. Bro. And didn't he just have his like house was like destroyed by a falling tree? Or something? Many trees. It was a crazy yeah. storm. He moved to Connecticut in this, I've been there, it's a beautiful home in the oh, countryside okay. with a barn and a big pool and a pool house. I mean, he's like Norma Desmond living in this place and uh, <laughs> in more ways than one. And yes, so then just six weeks ago, I think there was a huge storm in Connecticut, trees down, and his home was uh, partially smashed in. So he's in the process of, he's living in a rental that he loves. He, he and his little dog Benson are very happy oh. there. And I talk to him all the time. And uh, the insurance company is, you know, they're going through all that, you know, what you have to go through with insurance companies and um, having it rebuilt and fixed up. So hopefully he'll be back in before the holidays. Cool. I remember I had gotten a text and I think some friends had started a GoFundMe page for him to try yeah. to help. Yeah. So I had donated to that so people can find that online. But they, anyway, back to Tyne Daily. Oh, oh yeah. So Tyne. Well, <laughs> I, um, I knew Tyne because back in my early LA days, we did a production of Ballroom together. Um, oh, and God. with with and Charlie Durning played opposite her, who had played in the original Queen of the Stardust Ballroom with Maureen Stapleton, the TV movie, which oh, wow. Michael Bennett and everybody based the musical on. And then mm -hmm. the musical wasn't so successful, but we were doing a sort of a reboot of it in LA, and time was incredible, and we were we stayed friends. And then uh, many years later, she said, "I want to put this show together. I've been asked to do it." around and would you love to you know would you work with me and i said of course i would be so thrilled to so i did arrangements for her and we had a little little band um yeah, i wish we'd recorded it we never did record it we should have yeah that, we, i didn't see that but that would have been something because i remember reading about it we did it all over and it was so much fun she's she's one of those great she's one of the great people in the world you know she's her life has been so incredible and she is uh, absolutely warm and loyal and beautiful, and I, I adore her. Every moment with her is just like a gift, you know? It's great. I remember meeting her th uh, through Terrence McNally, mm -hmm. and um, I remember, you know, it's funny. There are some people that they particularly, you know, we said this earlier in the show, that when you meet somebody through someone they trust, it's it's there's not that wall there. They are really... Yes they're really themselves with you. And I just remember that it was like, I'd known her forever. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't expect that because she does give a lot of these strong people. They have to build up this veneer because people are going over to them all the time. I, people know Jennifer Lewis is one of my best friends. And so oh, she's always Jennifer Lewis, but 
I can be the one that says, oh, we have to go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Billy says, you know. Yeah, that exactly. means the bad guys. Thank God Billy says. <laughs> you know, exactly. Oh, wait. Somebody just wrote in. Boston loved John McTee for me. I, John I, McTee. Oh, that's Oh, great. you've got another John McDaniel out there. Oh. Um, so what were you working on right before the pandemic started? Was Sticks and Stones in the works at that point? Yes. In fact, I was in Nashville, February 24, 25, 26, doing a presentation. And we got our first production was scheduled to be at the Encore Theater in Ann Arbor that my friend Dan oh. runs. And he was like, we're so excited about this. We can't wait to do it. That was supposed to be in July. So we were in the planning, like this is gonna happen. And then no, it's not. I was supposed to conduct a, a concert version of South Pacific out at the Patch okay. Theater on Long Island, which is beautiful. I've been doing concerts there for the last couple of years, canceled. Uh, we took the Eugene O'Neill conference online this summer. Yeah, you I, you still did the master classes, we right? We did, yeah. And I did the Playbill Pride Spectacular concert for Playbill online. Virtually, that was my first big virtual concert. And now I'm doing like three, I have three coming up. It's I'm home every day and I've never been busier. It's and, so weird. And you've only been in the house now a year. Is the house where you want it to be? Are you able to do things? Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. It's really, it's, I mean, it's, no, it's not phenomenal. It's all, this quarantine is horrible. <laughs> Who am I kidding? But you know what? I'm making the best of it. And I'm yeah, saying, it's phenomenal in its own horrible way. Staying Not busy it. is phenomenal. I will say that. And I feel so lucky to have a way to do it. I found a way to do it. I work. I make recordings. I make really nice, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, it's, do you know Julie Garnier? You must know yes, Julie. Yes, I do. Yeah. She and I talked the other day. And since quarantine, she has made her own studio. And she's been doing online stuff. And it's like we're all just finding this new normal um, with our mics and all of our equipment and our gear and our skills. And who would have ever thought I would put a YouTube channel together, but I know how to do it now. Well, again, what that's the other thing is we've all really helped each other because I remember um, I had had rotator cuff surgery when this began yeah. and I was just kind of at my parents thinking I'm going to recuperate. And this started and I'm like, well, what do you do? And I sent Seth, a text saying what you guys are doing is great. And his response was, well, then get off your ass and do something. Yeah. Do something yourself. And I'm like, well, I got the arm, the parents, I don't know what I'm doing. He's like, I will talk you through it. Right. And then very shortly thereafter, you texted me and said, can you help me get this set up so I can do this as well? And, yeah. you know, we've all shared this knowledge with each other. And whenever people think, oh, people are territorial or they're not going to help you. That is so not, not true. true. This has brought out, I think, the best in many of us. 100 percent. It really has. It's you know, um, and especially for people who already had the knowledge, like Shaman, who already had an in-house studio. Right. Is, you know, when I said, well, I don't know how to do this. Well, this is what well, I have. Yeah. And it's not that different. You know, that's what he's been doing for decades. Exactly. Wait, yeah. okay. We've not me, one. but now no. I am. Well, you are now. Let's see. Okay. Oh, Robert Arujo says, it's, it's a pleasure Roberto. to work with John McTee. Roberto is editing our Sticks and Stones, and he's amazing. We worked oh. together on the Playbill Pride Spectacular, and, and yes, well, he wrote that as well. Yay, Play Playbill yeah. Pride! Yeah, and he always oh, a cat person. Roberto, you had me, then you lost me. <laughs> You're not a cat person. I'm not, you know, I have allergies. No, I don't need cats really. Uh, I don't have anything against cats, but no, no. Let's keep but the cats away. My mom has a cat, very special. Oh, cat. and named. and also we didn't met. Yes, were you going to say named? No, no, named Fiona, and she's a sweet little uh, calico. Interestingly Adorable. enough, I got an email today from Finola Hughes. Oh, you did? Okay. I that's did. So All right. people, people can look forward. You may have a Finola okay. on this show. All right. Um, you know, she was the mother in charms. Um, I was just going to say something, and I, it is just completely popped out of my head. You know, when you go with the Finola Hughes reference, you could be lost forever. Oh, what I was going to mention is people may not know, you have also conducted opera. Yeah, I did my first was opera. Did uh, Elizir? Was it was it Daughter of the Regiment. Okay, it was done in Tete. Yeah. I knew in St. Louis. In St. Louis, St. Louis Opera Theater is a gorgeous company. I loved working with them. I will say that the opera schedule freaked yeah. me out a little bit. 
I I don't think I liked it. There was there <laughs> you, because you have to you have to protect the gift, so you can't yeah. rehearse too often. So you every couple of days, every three days, and yeah. you come back three days later, and you're like, now what do we do? I mean, you know, in the theater, it's it's ten to six every day. So you you sleep, you come back, and you pick it up again. So it was like, and then you would do a piano dress rehearsal like a week before the opening and then nothing for days and then an orchestra dress and then nothing for days and then opening night for critics. I mean, it was, it's a little nuts. It's a little And you nuts. put it together in roughly two weeks, maybe, and yeah. it maybe runs four shows. I mean, I was fortunate. Our cast was extraordinary and we got great reviews. We were the darling of the season and it was super fun to do. But that's that's a lot. I don't know. How, I don't know how opera people do it that way all the time. I guess you get used to it. You just yeah. you get used to it. But coming from the theater, it was very different. I remember Patty Lupone when she did um, Ghosts of Versailles in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. Yeah. She said to me, she's like, I don't understand. We've done all this work and we only have five shows. Right. She's like, let's keep going. And I'm like, well, that's opera, it, not yeah. that's how it works. Exactly. Um, okay, John McDaniel, McDonald, excuse me, wrote a question. Did you ever work with Faye Dunaway? Oh my God, John McDonald was her assistant on Masterclass. Master okay, I told this way. Story. I know, I, I will Go. take this story. Um, I said some of it actually recently to Christopher on Tuesday. Um, so I was a pianist. I started out as a musician and then got into comedy and then was an actor. And I was uh, an Act in acting school at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And Patty Lupone, interestingly enough, was coming in to replace Zoe Caldwell in Masterclass. David Loud, our a friend yeah. of both of ours, <laughs> David Loud had been the original pianist. And he was leaving with, uh, at the time he was going to leave, he ended up staying a little longer. So they wanted a new cast for Patty. And they had opened the um, auditions up to anybody. And I was non-equity. And I'm like, okay, it's acting. It's playing the piano. I'm in. This is my role to lose. Yeah. yeah. And um, I went in. You know, they said prepare a piece. And I wasn't thinking. I had never done a Broadway audition. And so I picked some, like, Chopin piece, like a Polonaise that was going to be really showy. And, you know. I was fine, but I didn't get a call back. I didn't get anything. I'm like, okay, fun experience. Glad I did it. Moving right. on. Next. Yeah. So um, Robert Folia was the director, if I'm not mistaken. No, Leonard Folia, excuse me. Leonard, Leonard Folia. Right. right. And um, when they started putting together the national tour, which was going to star Faye Dunaway, they remembered me. I made enough of an impact that they invited me back. And they said, you know, would you like to come in audition for this? Well, now I know I want this. It's Faye Dunaway. Right. I'm going to be able to like write a book at the end of this tour. And so I um, went to the Broadway theater the night before the audition. And I made notes of everything the person who was playing the role at that time did. How he had his hair, what he was wearing, that okay. he had a tie clip, that right. he put his scores on the piano a certain way. Right. And so I show up at the audition almost identical to him. Yeah. And they welcome me yeah. in. Yeah, well, because now I know. Yeah. So I, you know, I make a production of putting down the scores and arranging the pencils. And Leonard turned to the casting director and said, could somebody call and see if the if the costume is still in the theater? <laughs> so they knew what I was doing. And so they asked me to play. And this time I played what he plays in the show. And he plays three pieces. And I did a medley of all three. Very good. So I'm like, okay. So they said to me, very clever. And I'm like, well, all right, I'll take clever. Okay. And so I'm still sticking in character, very quiet, which is so not like me. And very, thank you. <laughs> you were yes. doing your best. I was doing what I could. So they had me read lines and I'm reading, you know, which is yes, Madam Collis, no, Madam Collis. There's not much there. So they said, thank you, whatever. And then they called me back for a callback. And I'm like, okay. they did the same thing. So then I never heard from them. And uh, I said, well, didn't get that either. So when the tour was announced to open in Boston, 
I, I reached out to Leonard Foley and I said, I'm just curious for as a, you know, as a future experience, what was wrong? Why didn't I get it? And he said, Oh, you didn't do anything wrong. Faye, you were actually one of our top two or three. I don't remember. He said, Faye would, the last uh, audition was to meet Faye, a chemistry test. And Faye would only meet equity members. And Got I wasn't it. equity. Right. So you didn't get the, you didn't get the chance. Yeah. No. And so you just let it go. Right. But somebody told Faye about me and she invited me to come meet her uh, the day after opening night. And so, oh, I wish I had the picture. I don't have the picture up. So uh, I had said to her, I had plans with my mother, as of course we all do. Sure. And she said, well, bring your mother. I'd love to meet your mother. Okay. So I get to the Wilbur Theater and she is speaking to other people. And I'm told very firmly to wait outside the curtain as if I can't hear what's happening behind the curtain. <laughs> And Faye's screaming and yelling at this um, person. And I'm very cross. And I'm very upset. And I'm very this and very that. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, I wish I was taking notes because this is all a little bit beautiful. Right. So anyway, finally the curtain opens and she's a completely different. Hello. Please come in. And she's so soft-spoken and so phony. Um you know, because because I've already heard her yelling, so right. I know that that no, doesn't have to talk. Yeah. You know, I mean, nothing against her. I'm sure whatever the people were doing wasn't right, but, you know. Yeah. Okay, so I go in, and I met her, and I said that, uh, you know, introduced her to my mother. And my mother is, has absolutely no filter, so, you know, where'd I get it from? And, um, oh, I thought I had the picture here. I don't. Okay. And so my mother says to Faye, my mother's very petite, and says to Faye, oh, you were so wonderful in the show. You were great. And you're so beautiful and so thin. What are you, a size two? And Faye just laughs. <laughs> no, actually, I'm a zero. And, oh. my mother, and my mother, who doesn't care who this is, say, right. a zero? You got to be shitting me. <laughs> That's and I feel like, Fast. and Faye's like, did you just say shitting me? Yeah. So, uh, away. Yeah. And we took photos and she was, and she was lovely. And uh, more recently I saw Faye again, you know, I've written horrible things about her, but it's stories people tell me, sure. but we met at the Beverly center, you know, maybe last Christmas Okay, and she was having trouble finding her car. And she was another one who's gotten very frail and had an assistant and I helped her to her car and she couldn't have been lovelier to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, one, one of the things I've learned is people, on stage and off, I'm not necessarily the same person. You are. I am. It's like what you see is like what, what you, you get. get. Yeah, I agree. But a lot of people are not, and you just have to roll with it. Who is the most different? Not better or worse, but just different off stage. Oh, what a good question. What Thank a good one. <laughs> I don't know who was the most different. Who no, surprised you? The, so I think back to the Rosie thing because you yeah. know she was because you met everybody. Well, I did, but also Rosie, you know, she was built up as being this like queen of nice. Do you remember when she was the oh, queen of nice? So and you, oh, right. who can live up to that? So you know, then you're trying, then you're somebody, you're you're yelling at somebody because they're doing something, you know, horrible, and all of a sudden, oh, I guess you're not the queen of nice. Well, that's not that's not fair. We are multifaceted. We have likes, dislikes. We we're, we're not. We're not cookie cutters, you know? So, and we're not between a nice 24 hours a day. Correct. Correct. Um, you know, I think her initial persona on the show was very heightened and, and very, you know, like she was acting with Dennis DeYoung. That's her. That is the the up showbiz. I'm sitting in my new job and I'm so happy. That's all real, you know, but that's not 24 hours a day, you know? It's a part of me at that time in that situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, and I also think that it's there's an expectation, and especially for a comedian, um, comedians are built to please, and so you want to please everybody. And the other thing is, is frankly, what people don't know 
if they if they don't know Rosie like you do or as little as I do is that she is a huge fan. She that's you cannot manufacture. That's absolutely that. right. You yeah. know, which is what made her the perfect person for that job. And also that's who you are. I mean, I think that's something you both never lost is you were the kids in the candy store. Well, like, can day. you believe we're sitting here with Barbara Streisand? What was Barbara Streisand like? 100%. What was Barbara like? Barbara. Barbara was the one that, you know, we had a memo circulated not to look at her or touch her, or, you know, and we were like, well, what? <laughs> Did you, know, you get a picture with her? I'm sure you didn't. I don't know if I have it. We did do, you know, yeah, I have it somewhere. I have photos. Oh my God. <laughs> Boxes. And now, you know, everything's digital. So it's an, it's another, another world. Yeah. I think that I, I met Barbara. I did not take a photo with Barbara. There was not an opportunity to get a photo with Barbara. Yeah. Yeah, that, I can tell. that was a thrilling show, though, because Rosie had loved her truly since the time she was a kid. So it was it was uniquely wonderful to have her there. Was what great. was it like playing Marty the Martian for Barbara Streisand while Rosie sang it? Here's a question. <laughs> Out of body. Out yeah. of body. Out of body. Was that just insane? Because you had to have rehearsed that. Uh, no. We never rehearsed that stuff. Never. She just rehearsed. turned to you and said, let's do Marty the Martian and I you're did, there? I did rehearse though with Rosie and Madonna did the, um, we did a send up sort of a Buenos Aires and we did rehearse that. And that was, uh, uh, Madonna was in Rosie's dressing room. This was the day before. And we rarely rehearsed, but she wanted to. And so we did. And um, the, we were in Rosie's dressing room on the floor, the three of us for what seemed like an hour, sort of figuring it out. And then we went out on the set and went through it and did it the next day. It's crazy, crazy. Was there any bad mishap that we don't know about that you're sitting there saying, if you go back and watch it, you'll see? I don't know of any, but the one, you know, we had, Luther Vandross was on once and we came back from commercial and she held up the CD and said, and now Luther Vandross, and we, you know, went to him and his band, he had brought his own band. And the keyboard didn't work. And so oh. there was no sound. And and we were all like, and it was silent. And it nothing, seemed, you know, and TV time is like, come on, let's go. So it seemed like forever. It was probably four seconds. And then we and then you saw the tech guys scrambling with their they all had, you know, headphones and trying to figure it out. And we went to commercial and figured it out, and came back and then did the number. But live TV, like you can't if the Cable isn't working or it went out or something. It can't start the song without the keyboard because that's the only thing that plays at the top of the song. This is, you know, that was what was great about being live is that we- No, and then when it switched to day, one day delay, was that a big difference in the season show? Season two, season two, we had a new executive producer who believed in promos. So she said, we have to be able to promo Tuesday's show. We have to shoot it on Monday. So we started not being live and it did suck the air out because the live thing is just so great. It's like a giant plug into the wall and you go and then you unplug it and you're done. But when you know you can stop tape, it's not the same. It's not no, the same. it's absolutely not. And I know um, I have a friend that will say to me, like at the beginning of The View, which is live most days, he'll say, well, they said they were going to talk about this in Hot Topics. Why didn't they? And I said, because things happen. You they get off on the something tangent, else. Yeah. And we'll get to it another time. He's like, well, they never got it. I'm like, that's live TV. Correct. You know, you know, and also I think because you guys were on the East Coast, it made it easier because I know when the talk now, they have to tape, I think I was told, they have to be at the studio like at six or something because they tape at eight because it has to go out to the East Coast. That is really early. What was it like being there live in those early days? Where you had Judy Gold, you had Seth, you had all of these people that you're all just new to this. Yeah. Well, none of us had ever done TV before. I'd never done. Rosie asked me to do it. And I said yes on the phone and hung up and said, oh, I don't know. How to, I don't know how to do a TV band. And then I went and sat on her couch in her office the first day. And I was like, no, what do you want me to do? And she said, just do what you do. And I was like, oh, OK, well, that sort of makes sense. And then we just did what we do, you know. 
But, I know uh, Judy, Judy on this show talked about how that you guys would just have to come in the morning and not know what you were facing, but at least you were all friends. It's like, okay, let's just make this work. Let's just do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, that was super fun. There was the time, you know, when she said, usually I would get the lyrics to the parodies. We would never rehearse them, but I would know what the song was going to be. So I'd know, you know, kind of what, what I was up for. But once at, at one minute to 10, I got the lyric and it was the song Donka Shane. And I know that, you know, I know the song. I know, you know, Wayne Newton made Wayne. Yeah, Wayne Newton. Wayne made Newton. It very famous. And but I didn't know it. So we got there and I was like, and I didn't know what, so she was so then that was like for a week. That was like uh, the hilarious thing. So the next day, the parody was set to the tune of something else, all about how John doesn't know Donka Shane. And of course, now I do, but. Yes. Well, I do remember when she, and one, that was one of the fun things is that she would just say, oh, do you know this? And sometimes you would just say, yeah, no, I don't. Usually, no, I, you know, I know I have a crazy encyclopedia inside there of songs. And so that was super, you know, fun. And usually I was, you know, able to do it, but not Donka Shane. Not Donka Shane. All right. Well, they, but now you can at a moment's notice. If I had to. Um, okay, we're going, we're going to, oh God, there's just a couple, oh, somebody wrote a very long, that John McDonald has a long, a lot of stories about Faye Dunaway. All right, John, we will talk, John McDonald, we will talk off camera. Um, <laughs> and he's probably talking about that crazy play she did at the Huntington, like two years ago, where she, oh, where she was treating people horribly. Wasn't she, yeah, she was yeah. treating the, the stage managers like, oh, so, Crazy. Uh, awful. I mean, again, it was the whole you can't look at me, get on the floor and clean the clean the floors with the toothbrush. I mean, it was just <laughs> madness. And you know, it's funny, I always find that 90% of the people, like you said, Elaine Stritch has this um reputation of being tough and no nonsense, but they're professional. Absolutely. And when you are there with them working on something, you're in it together. Yeah. Giving it 180% all the time, you know? And the people who really are difficult to their collaborators, I fear, have, uh, they're, they're really worried of being found out. That well, there's some sort it, of just fear. And I fear. think, I think it's fear. I think it's just a, it's a wall up of, you know, I'm afraid to be open and vulnerable or to be wrong or to be, you know, out of my element or whatever. It's, life's too short. Just, you know. Well, and you also can't put that pressure on yourself. I mean, that's what we were talking about doing all these things. When you're doing your, your um, Sunday afternoon shows, which are right here. Yeah, Sunday there it is. There he is, November 1st, 3 p.m. Eastern, please. We have to remind people Eastern, there are yeah. different time zones. And I guess it'll be EST by then. Do we change in October? I think we do. Oh, is it the, November? Yeah, my, I, don't I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. They'll tell us. Am. The people will tell us. You know, whatever. I know because on mine, I just write Eastern. I don't even do the A. You don't get it. When I say the EST or EDT, people are like, what the hell is TCB? Yeah, I don't know. But you know, we have you had mishaps doing these live shows? I'm sure you had to have yet, me. really. Not not really? Well, actually, the very first show. So I was I was going to sing. It, it was Mother's Day, and I always sing "Mama a Rainbow" to my mom because I have mm -hmm. for, for decades, and that's just a thing. And so we got to. I had my lyric sheets all set, but I got to uh, the end of the show, and I hadn't sung "Mama Rainbow," and I said good night, everybody, goodbye, or whatever. And then I was talking to my sister and she said, why didn't you sing Mama Rainbow? And I thought, because I didn't have a lyric sheet because I know the lyrics. So, so you just skipped it. So that was like, all right, whatever. Then I just did it on the next show. But it's, you know, again, live, whatever happens. Two shows ago, I lost, almost lost my voice. I was doing some people from Gypsy. I know. Of course uh, you are. To close the show. Of course I was. As one does. And I, you know, and I was, I had, I just got a scratchy throat and I started coughing. I was like, I'm fine. I'm fine. But you know, it's live. What are you going to do? No, I think that um, I will get really upset. I will get really angry about something. And then I'll have friends that say, like, you did it. You got through it. Who yeah. cares? The, um, the show I did Tuesday with Christopher Titus, I was at a show. I, I can tell this now, even though we didn't talk about it on the show. I was at one of his shows in Irvine, California, when white supremacists showed up at the show and interrupted the show. First off, it takes balls to interrupt a comedian with a mic. 
who right. can eviscerate you and have security right. there like that. Um, but I was sitting in the audience and, you know, as a performer in the audience, there is that helpless feeling because you know what's happening and there's nothing you can nothing do. You, can you do. see it, you see it coming. Sometimes you hear these things before it hits the stage. And I've been in audiences when I can hear a mistake that a singer is going to make five minutes before they do, because I just know what's happening. But in this case, Christopher Titus, he let the supremacist talk. I don't even remember what he was talking about. Yell, scream. All I kept thinking is these people bought tickets to heckle. Right. So I'm thinking, well, thank you for the tickets and the two drink minimum and goodbye. Get out. And, um, right. and they let them out. And then there were, there were others protesting outside. It was something that had been planned. And in these days where you're hearing about white supremacists, the only time it happened was that time with me. And I do remember having fear that something could happen, that something could be thrown like a table or chairs in a club or that a riot could come out because you don't know. And it, it that's this, that's yeah. scary. Yeah, Sitting yeah. here talking to you about some people is not scary. Not scary. No, but th there are crazy people out there, you know, and you get in a group and you never, you know, it's, it's, we've been lucky. I've never been hit by a table or a chair. <laughs> So but far. I will point out that we started the show being very vague about where you are. Well, thank you. <laughs> do you get? Do, you know. are, you, are you in a house or a con like? Do you have neighbors who sit there and go, "That's John McDaniel from the Rose so Show." So funny thing, yes, it's a house, mid-century house, and uh, those are neighbor, great houses. Oh, it's so I, I love houses. it. I love it yeah. so much. Our neighbor just over here one day was like. She she had that sort of reaction that I get once in a while. Are, are you are you? You know, and she would and she went insane. She started jumping up and down like a schoolgirl. She was like, I was pregnant when I when you know I had my kids and I watched you every day. And the, the, it's you wouldn't, I mean, it's a lot of people who watch that. That was a huge show. Of course. Was, and you are really part of their lives because yeah. when you come into their houses every day, as ourselves, just, not as yeah. not actors, you know, just ourselves. Which is, again, where that queen and nice issue, because they do feel that you're my friend, you owe me something when, you know, I remember Blakey saying to Rosie when they would go out and people would say, Rosie, Rosie, and he would say as a kid, Rosie O'Donnell is a show. Thank you. You know, that that's <laughs> not his mother. Right. That is right. That is uh, right. Uh, but speaking of shows, let us remind people, Sticks and Stones. Yay! This, uh, Friday. Next no, Friday. next Friday. Next Friday. A week from tomorrow. And at, at 8 p.m. Eastern. Do you notice there you wrote 8 p.m. Eastern? Eastern. Well, that's Broadway Cares because they know what they're doing. But <laughs> um, but uh yeah, and it'll be up for four days. So if you miss it, if you have plans with Aunt Tilly on Friday night and you can't see it, then it'll be up for four days only. Because that's because of the Actors' Equity Union and the American Federation of Musicians. It can only be four days. But we are trying to, you know, raise a ton of money for those beautiful organizations. And uh, you know, all... which again, and here's the bigger one, which has the full cast. Is yeah. there? Are they, well, there is only the, there is only five people. Are there other principals in the show? These are the five principals. But then we have 135 kids who play other roles. Actually, uh, oh, there, are, really? there, are, there are six brothers who are a boy band, very in sync. Wow. Um, and when two sisters who are like our narrators and they are, they auditioned and one's in Nashville. I forget where Gabby is, but they're amazing. It's, it's going to be an extraordinary uh, piece. People can go to broadwayworld.com. Oh, look how fancy. Yeah. Well, you know, while you were talking, when, when you were telling <laughs> the some people story, I oh, I Gab, you were <laughs> piping. <laughs> um, and uh, follow John on Facebook um, and his YouTube channel, wherever it is. If you look for John McDaniel and Helen Reddy. Yeah, you, then you you'll find it and you can subscribe. And, and I will actually, below the description on this for Facebook and YouTube, right. I will link to it as well so that um, people can find you and subscribe. And you know, people, I say, I don't say this nearly enough, and I have friends that get so angry with me. Subscribe to our YouTube channels because the more you, so if we get, absolutely nothing nothing for any of these shows people like oh people are making money and monetize there is no this has cost both of us 
far more than we could ever make. Um, but it was fun. fun. <laughs> it's fun. And it also builds the community if you subscribe because Correct. it does promote us to your friends. Yeah. And on and Facebook, if you click the both- bell, the bell will give you the notifications when something new. Oh, the alarm. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, we, we, I schedule the shows a day in advance. How early do you schedule yours? I'm not, I'm just moving things over there now. I just started this week. So I'm, I'm a baby, but you know, people, people are watching. I can see. Yeah. And I, when it pops up uh, also on Facebook, it, if when we announce a show, it will pop up and you can click on a reminder right. and you will get a reminder. I mean, it's, I say Amazing. this, like I know what the hell I'm doing. I have no Amazing. idea. But, yeah. um, but I love you. You know I love you. I love you too. We had so, so much fun. You. Oh, Johnny, you know this is like the most no. This is the most normal part of my day. Yeah. I am like I am like Carol Channing that Billy Masters only exists. And then good night, and then both of us and just then, yeah. collapse. It's exhausting. Are you tired all the time? No, uh, surprisingly no. I mean, sometimes I have we call it malaise, and we'll be like, yeah. oh, I got, I got the malaise. And then I'll just go and take a nap and get up and start again. And it's fine. But it's, it's you know, mostly okay. I got a flu shot yesterday. And my arm hurts. Oh, my God. My best friend got one yesterday, too. Is he hurting you? A little bit. A little bit of sensitivity. But, you know, I'm glad I did it. Um, well, so, yeah, you know, you one, one less thing maybe to have to worry about. For now, know. perhaps. I don't know. I don't know. One thing I know is that uh, I'm going to be watching Sticks and Stones next week. I'm really excited about it because the more you talk about it, I didn't know there were all these aspects to it in different styles and yeah, different. Yeah, it's going to be extraordinary. Involved. We're so excited. Um, We're yeah, so I, and again, good people. But again, good people always find the good people. Right on. Just how it works, Johnny. I love you. Um, hang around afterwards, and I'll talk to you off camera okay, when we cool. leave. Goodbye, but everybody. thank you for doing it. It was so much fun. We been, uh, we had you. You surprised us with Faith Prince. So I, uh, I it's nice to have you here as an official person on the show. It was awesome. Thanks for and having. Then next, next time, I'm going to have all new people to embarrass you with. Fabulous. I look forward to it. Thank you, Johnny. You. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Um, oh, hold on. Wait, now I got to see. I almost ended the show. I'm not ending the show. I'm saying goodbye to you. Bye, Johnny. And if Johnny's parents are watching, which they may have watched, if not, they'll see it. They'll after watch time. later. We didn't say anything too embarrassing, I don't think. No, I don't think so. No, I think that was good. This was the clean version of the show. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. McDaniel, for creating such a wonderful son who has brought so much joy to my life and countless other people. Thanks, thank you, Billy. Johnny. See you soon. I'll talk to you later. Uh, and thank you all for watching Billy Masters Live on thir- on Tuesday. I don't know who's here. It could be your Blander sister. It could be Finola Hughes. I don't know who's coming, but it could just be me sitting here reading the tabloids. And if it is, it is because you didn't pay to get in. But this has been Billy Masters Live and uh, I am Billy Masters. And just remember, if we're here, we're live. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Uh, Stay away from people. Unless you want to have sex with me, then just call me and we'll figure it out. All right. Bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you.